Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming here. I'm very happy to have my advisor, Professor Rajiv Gupta, who's faculty at University of California, Riverside, to be here with us today. He's going to be talking about his current research on speculative paralyzation for multicorps. OK, thanks. OK, so if I don't sound enthusiastic about my work, it's probably because I'm sitting down and giving the talk, not because I don't <laughs> like the work. <laughs> OK. Uh, so as Sriram said, I'll be talking about speculative paralyzation. And uh, really, the goal here is as follows, that you may have programs where uh, when you run them, you observe that there is parallelism, but you're not able to. Uh, Okay. But you're not able to statically necessarily parallelize the programs. And so this could be due to a number of reasons. So for example, you could have a uh, you know, part of the code which is very infrequently executed. The dependencies could arise from there. But in most cases, when you don't execute it, you may observe parallelism. It could be because there are dependencies, but those dependencies are really harmless. So if you ignored them, in parallelization, it wouldn't really uh, hurt the program. Uh, or it could be because the dependencies are there because you read and write memory, but actually you read and re you, you overwrite a value with the same value. So those dependencies actually don't have any impact. So, so for various reasons, you have parallelism, but you can't do it statically. So the goal of this work basically is to you know, what we did is we developed a very simple execution model, which will allow you to speculatively execute programs uh, or parts of programs. And basically what it consists of is you, you divide your computation into the non-speculative part and the speculative part. So if you wouldn't, wouldn't do any speculation, it would be like sequentially executing the program uh, uh, through this non-speculative thread. But if you get speculative threads, then you get things done sooner and these threads are actually running on the uh, additional cores that you have. And of course, once these threads finish, you have to commit the results. And we'll commit the results if the speculation is successful. Otherwise, we simply throw away the results. In other words, these speculative threads don't overwrite uh, results in the non-speculative state. So you don't require any rollback. You simply throw away the information that you computed. And then we have, in our work, we have taken this idea and we had applied it to some parallelization of some loops, uh, which had coarse grain parallelism. And this was implemented entirely in software. And so we have some results there. And then in more recent work, we are developing architectural support so we can apply the same idea to do more fine grain parallelization. And one example of that is uh, you can speculatively execute past barriers, small amounts of code. And if speculation doesn't fail, then you are ahead. Um, OK, so this is the model. So as I said, so we have one main thread and then any number of parallel threads. The main thread does the non-speculative computation. The parallel thread does all the speculative computations. The main thread controls what these parallel threads do. So it creates them, initializes, gives them work, takes back the results performs the misspeculation check and commits the results in order. By that I mean that if you, if you assign the work to many threads one after another, you will commit the results also in the same order. Uh, and you know, so, so basically then you are ma making sure you're following the sequential semantics of the program. OK, uh, so this is just showing that visually. Uh, so if we have a loop, we divide the loop into three parts. Uh, the prologue, the epilogue, and this is the speculative body. So this is what's going to run in parallel. These parts are going to run sequentially. So it's going to be something like this. Let's say the main thread is going to execute the prologue and assign the work to the two threads. They execute. When one of them finishes, it returns the results to the main thread. It commits the results, and it assigns more work to it. Same thing with the next one. And when these finish, you know, those results are committed. So you can see that the epilogue and prologue are being executed in exactly the same order as they were originally in the program. And it's the, only the speculative body which is executed in parallel. Uh, 
So I'm showing this main thread and these two threads, but this main thread doesn't actually run on a separate core. So actually this main thread, since its job is to just at these transition points deal with these threads. When one of these thread is done, then this thread wakes up, takes care of this work, and then it goes back to sleep. So this main thread is just waking up at these different cores to do the assignment of work and committing the uh, results. Okay so, um, okay, so this is what the state looks like. So we have the non-speculative state, which is the memory attached to the main thread. So if you are running the program sequentially, this is what you are running. But if you speculatively create parallel threads, then there will be separate memory here. And whatever this thread needs to read or write, it will read and write from here. And the point is that, uh, as I mentioned before, once you are done, if there was misspeculation, you simply throw away these results. And this is still intact. And you basically repeat the computation again till you're successful and then you commit the results. And there's another part, and this is where your, uh, what I say is coordinating state, which is the auxiliary information that you have to keep around so you know whether misspeculation has occurred or not. So for example, uh, we keep these version numbers, I'll talk about more in detail, but these version numbers let us detect misspeculation. Now, they let us detect misspeculation, but, but these version numbers don't allow us to do any rollback or anything, so there's no rollback in, involved. Uh, this is only for detecting misspeculation. Then there is this mapping table, and the reason we need this is because once you are done, you need to copy the results back from uh, there to here. So it's just telling you what to copy from where to where. Okay, so obviously if we do a lot of copying, like for example, if we were to copy this entire state from here to here, do everything and then copy it back, that's going to be very expensive. So the key thing is that we want to find out what we need to copy and can we reduce the overhead of that copying. Uh, and so, so we don't want to just copy and copy out everything, but what we have is this is where we are using profiling to figure out what we need to copy and what we can leave alone. Okay? Now since this is based on profiling, we cannot perfectly tell what we need to copy. Okay? It is not based on static analysis. So what you're doing is you're saying actually these things I think I need, so I'm going to copy. These other things I don't think I need, I won't copy. And if things work out okay, then everything is fine. But you have to provide a backup mechanism so that if you touch something that you didn't touch during the profiling run, then on the fly you can bring it over. So on the fly, you have to provide this mechanism. So the way to think about it is the exception. It's like having an exception mechanism. If you don't have the value, an exception happens and it brings the value back. But once you provide this, then this can be probabilistic. You can, you know, you can copy some things, not other things. And you, because you always fall back on this to bring in the value at runtime. And the mapping table essentially now keeps what you brought from where and so on, but also the version number. Now let me explain a little bit about the version number. Uh, when you copy from the non-speculative state to speculative state, you're copying shared data. Each of the shared data will have a version number attached to it. So every time you change it, you increase the version number. Now you're copying that because when you are done, when the speculative thread is done with the work, the version number shouldn't have changed. If it has changed, that means it read the value too early, an earlier thread changed the value, so that means we have a misspeculation. Okay, so, so another way uh, to explain this is that what the speculative threads are doing is they are reading values before they were before all the earlier computation is done. So in a way, we are doing a prediction of those values, but the prediction is simply the current value. And then later on, we just need, so we need the versions numbers just to tell that a misspeculation has occurred, not because we uh, want to do anything more elaborate than that. So after that, once we have the, these version numbers, uh, you know, we will be able to, when we commit, that's when we are checking if the version numbers are the same or not. And, uh, and so, so the misspeculation is simply if any version number doesn't match, you, are, you have a misspeculation. Uh, this is just a side comment, but uh, you, know, you could do the checks on uh, addresses, but if you have some values where you think that usually you write to those variables, but their values don't change, 
then you can do a value-based check also, but it'll be more expensive because you have to remember the old value. Then even though you think it has been overwritten, it's been overwritten with the same value, and therefore you don't have a misspeculation. Uh, but the key thing here is that because of the way it is, we do the version number check, a misspeculation occurs, you throw away the results. There is no rollback or anything. You simply go back and repeat the computation. You basically set it up again and you repeat the computation. And if, uh, if one thread misspeculates, then the later threads can't commit their results, you know? So it's not that if one thread misspeculates, then all the later threads are squashed. No, they do their work, they wait for the first thread to finish, and then they try to commit. If they can't commit, then they repeat their computation. So it's possible that uh, later threads are finished earlier because they didn't misspeculate, and if nothing went wrong, they could still commit their results right away. This is just an example to show uh, you know, how we are dividing up the loop into three parts. And uh, this is the prologue, this is the epilogue, this is the speculative part. So what you would put in the prologue and epilogue are the things which you know are dependent from iteration to iteration. So there's no point speculating on them because you're gonna misspeculate. Plus you put all the IO stuff there because you can't uh, do I.O. from the speculative computation. So what is happening is if there are any I.O. operations there, they are simply buffered. And only when you commit the results, you actually do the I.O. So, so this is basically separating out the speculative part from the rest of the loop body. And whatever goes up or down goes into the prologue, epilogue and prologue. Then, uh, so, 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 when you so once you have divided a loop like that into these three parts, and you transform it, it looks something like this. That first, you are creating the threads and giving them some work. When you give them the work, you execute the prologues. Then you are waiting. Uh, I mean, by you, I mean the main thread is waiting. And when thread finishes, it checks if the speculation has been successful. If it has been successful, it's fine. It'll go ahead and give it more work. But if it's been misspeculated, it asks us to repeat the work. It copies the values again with the new version numbers and the computation is repeated. Otherwise, you commit the results and you assign more work to it. And then you repeat the whole thing again. When you are committing, that's when you're using the mapping table to copy the values back. So, uh, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, yeah, sure. So where does the, the value get stored? Like in the example you showed for parser, the line variable is getting overwritten conceptually every time you run the prologue. Uh, now, if that were to be stored in memory, how would you go back and redo the computation for a particular iteration? Okay, so the prologue is not executing speculatively. So, um, so what you're doing is basically you're not really, uh, I mean, you have executed the prologue once. You're not re-executing the prologue. You're simply uh, okay, re I, mean, I guess I get, but where's the state of memory buffer? Like, there's the state of memory at the beginning of every speculative thread, and that needs to be buffered somewhere, right? So that you oh, can okay. re-execute yeah, the speculative so, so all, piece all that is in part of this space I showed on the right-hand side, which is with the thread. Okay. So when you're setting up the thread, you're allocating the space, you're giving it, you know, I mean, you have to make sure if you need to save something, like you said, the line, you have to save it there. So when you repeat it, you can repeat okay, it. Okay, so that's both the working storage as well as the initial states. Right? Exactly, okay. exactly. So it's a lot of copying, yeah. Okay, so this so this is so as far as the thread is concerned, actually, it's very straightforward. All it does is, it waits, uh, it waits for a signal to start the work. It does the work. It signals is done the work, and then next time when it does it, you know, again the main thread will say, now you're set up again. Do it again. Whether it's the old work you are doing or new work you are doing, it you know, it's basically the same thing. When a thread misspeculates, um, do you automatically um, have all the rest of the threads also? Uh, do you tell them that they misspeculated, or do you wait to see individually whether each? We of wait to see because it's possible that the dependencies are, you know, not from, not, uh, not like that. So, uh, uh, especially if they have finished the work, then might as well check, you know, rather than throw them all away. So, yeah. So basically, what we'll do is we'll. It's like you're stuck on the earlier thread because you misspeculated. It repeats. Eventually, you'll succeed. Once you succeed, you go to the next one. You check if misspeculation occurs, then you will ask it to repeat. So in the worst case, you will squash all of them, but you don't a priori squash them. So, I mean, there are a couple of uh, sort of other uh, issues uh, here that, um, 
obviously this is not a very scalable thing you know because the main thread is doing some parts of the computation serially as it was in the original program. So, of course, this is not going to scale forever, but I think for small number of threads it will scale. Uh, but even in the small number of threads, uh, which is we, we did it for 8 cores uh, because that is the number of cores we had on our machine. Uh, you can run into this problem that if you are giving very little work to each of these threads, while you are assigning work to them, you know the first one has finished and now you are assigning to the fourth, fifth. So, having more cores does not help because you could have might as well go back to the first thread or the first core assign the work to it. So, here they, I mean there is no magic solution here for us basically what we need to do is assign the big enough chunk of work. So, that by the time you have assigned to everybody and you come back you know the first one has just finished or it is not been sitting around for a while. So, you need to uh, make sure that uh, if you do not want this idling to happen you, you give it a bigger chunk of work. Then uh, the other thing is that in, in one of these programs we saw that if you use more threads the misspeculation rate increased and I think because if you are doing more threads in parallel there are more dependencies along which you are speculating and if, if the application is such you will have more problems. Uh, so, in that case uh, we found it to be beneficial that if we for some values which were causing this misspeculation, we do not um, we do not copy them in the beginning, we just leave them alone because if we copy them later there is a chance that the thread that was going to overwrite it has already overwritten it and you will actually get the real value. So, you have you can so you can tune what you copy uh, because you always have this mechanism. <laughs> So, earlier I was trying to say we want to copy everything beforehand kind of maybe or implied that we should not copy everything beforehand that we really need, but among those they may be such that you need them, but they will be overwritten. So, you should delay their copy. So, uh, our implementation is basically we use the pin for getting the profiling information, but it is the transformations are being done in the intermediate format for LLVM and uh, essentially uh, all of it is not fully automated. So, we basically have the template as I described uh, where you put the prologue, where you do the epilogue, the overall structure of the program is fixed and what the this LLVM lets us do is it lets us separate the different parts of the program, what goes into the speculative body, what goes into the epilogue and so on. And uh, once it identifies those parts, uh, it is not fully aut automated, some of it we actually manually plug into this template. And then, uh, then whatever back end we have, we generate the code from LLVM intermediate code and then the machine that we ran it on was, uh, uh, so this has 2 quad cores, so a total of 8 cores. So, it was a Dell machine. So, we ran, so we were able to run 6 programs. So, again I want to point out these 6 programs are not like we just picked up 6 programs and have we got good results. No, I mean there are some programs which we picked up uh, like when we are looking at my bench, uh, they are actually statically parallelizable. So, we do not want to look at those because they are statically parallelizable. So, it is not really a very valid test for this. Then the other thing is these are the programs we did. There were some in progress which we could not get through because of you know problems, uh, but these were the programs which we first studied and we said oh, ok, I mean there is parallelism here. So, let us put them through the framework ok. So, I am not claiming that you know give me any program I will speed it up by factor of 8 on 8 cores or something like that. Just, so, all this show all the results show is that there are programs on which you can get speed ups through the speculative parallelization. This is simply sh showing the number of areas you are copying in, copying out and so on. And this is just to indicate that this uh, you know the copying in, copying out that you are doing statically is not very huge. And the cases where you do a lot of copying is usually the heap, but the heap we always handle on the fly. And so, in those programs the heap copying dominated but this is excluding the heap. So, this is the one which we do a priori. So, these are the speed ups. Um, so, this is the number of cores 
actually when I'm saying threads, thread, well, there's one thread per core and the main thread is just waking up everywhere. So this is eight, we had eight cores, so we went up till eight threads. So you have nine real threads. So we have nine real threads, so eight speculative threads. And uh, so more or less, at least it goes in the right direction, you know. The slope varies, but it is somewhat linear uh, in, in most of these programs. Is this focusing strictly on the speed of the portion you parallelize as opposed to the entire benchmark? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So in, among these programs, the MCF one, this is only the loop we parallelized. And in the others, uh, the main loop was the sort of the big loop, which was parallelizable. So there it was uh, the whole, whole execution. And so, so the speed ups on eight threads vary from three point something to seven point something. And, uh, but you know, some of these programs are easy to parallelize, like parser or this one or bzip. Uh, but, the, but the thing is that you, you know, at the same time, there are dependencies. So of course, as a user, you can rewrite these programs also, but there are dependencies. So you cannot just purely do using static analysis. You have to do speculative parallelization. That's sort of the main point. Um, oh, okay. So this is just showing that in four of the programs, uh, this thread idling was an issue. Once we reached four and, you know, it would just flatten out. Like here, here, this is maybe five, six, here, over here at six. It will flatten out, and actually it was because of this idling business. So if we assign bigger chunks of work, we were able to, uh, you know, get the speed ups uh, that we would like to get, yeah. Would the, would the idling situation improve if you dedicated a core to running the, the main thread rather than having a context switch around? The idling, will it improve? You know, no, I think the issue is not that because uh, you, uh, because it's not the main thread which is called, which is the problem. The problem is that uh, you give the f first thread some work. So let's say main thread we don't need; it's zero time. Let's forget about it. We give everybody work, but we are giving it one at a time. And, and that handing out those code that's running in the main thread, yeah, right? Yeah. That, that's exactly what I mean. So mm -hmm. that the main thread had more CPU cycles, it would be able to hand out faster. No, because when the main thread is executing, it's because that code is idle. Okay. You know, so so in, so initial implementation, we put it on the separate code. Then we moved it here, and it didn't, okay. you know, make much difference. So the problem simply is that uh, you're right, but so I we couldn't speed that part up. You know, that's right. the way to look at it. Yeah. This is just showing that there was there was only one program in these programs in uh, MCF where the misspeculation rate keeps increasing as you do more threads. And I suppose that must be because, you know, each thread is not, is dependent upon maybe iterations which go much earlier, in which case you will have, the more threads you have, more misspeculations you will have. If each thread was only dependent upon just the preceding thread, for example, then more threads don't hurt you. But if each thread can be dependent upon the previous three or two or one iteration, then it starts to increase. So th there are some of these, uh, so, so when we did the delayed copying where we just do some of the variables on the fly, then we did reduce it somewhat. Of course, we can't get rid of the problem because, you know, inherently these dependencies are there. If you spawn them off early, you are going to get misspeculation. But it did help out somewhat. Uh, I mean, this may also be an indication that this is probably the limit. If we had 16, probably we would do much better, you know, if we had more cores we naturally wouldn't do any better. Maybe this is, you know, this is where we would probably do the best. Okay, so this is just showing that if we had different copy strategy, we say, why not do everything on the fly? Allocate the storage, but copy everything on the fly. Or, um, uh, yeah. How do you decide when to copy something? And how do you protect this state, for instance, from writes from the perspective of how do we protect it? So basically, uh, the, the state which is for each thread is not um, written by any other thread, other than the main thread. It sets it up. So you allocate, say, you know, brand new s for stack, locals, everything. But how do you know that you don't have an error caused by mm -hmm. this predicted value that is used as a pointer and that goes erroneously into the state? 
erroneously. No, no, so we don't. Uh, Did we, different pages? Is there a lot of <laughs> No, no, yeah, yeah. So we don't have any protection for that, yeah. Okay. We don't have any protection for that. So, um, I mean, we could put something because, see, actually, uh, what would happen, like, I'm just thinking now, what would happen if that, that situation arose? Um, it would be a bug, because if it's not a bug, I mean, you, you always go back to the main thread, and main thread will read the current value and give it to you. Yeah, but the worry but, is that, that but if it overflows or something, that it yeah, causes some exception which otherwise, or maybe some some error. Yeah, so so that actually that's happens. why there is another piece of work which somebody did in Rod, no, not Rod, Rod, Rochester, where they did this using process level speculation, okay. because then they can get the protection from that. Uh, but one of the things uh, which motivated us to do this was with the process space. The thing was that um, when the speculation succeeded, you had to do a lot of copying. Right, because then now you say, you know, you speculate it, and this is successful. It is further ahead. So whatever you didn't copy from the previous process, you say previous process I don't need anymore. You have to copy. So the common case, I mean, if you're succeeding, you do copying, and here is the other. And there they kept, you know, then pages, and you know, they had some information for at page level, maybe to reduce it. So uh, yeah. So if you have a bug, I think you're right. This can happen. So this is showing that if we, if we are doing copying used on the fly, or we copy everything, by everything I mean like we copy the heap and everything beforehand, or optim no, heap we always copy on the fly. I mean copy all the variables beforehand, all of them on the fly, and this is the sort of the heuristic, which is the optimized one. So it, do, it does pay off a little bit, but in some cases, but we, had, we would have thought it would have paid off much more, but I think the problem is that a lot of the references are to the heap, and the heap, all three techniques are the same for the heap. So therefore, for example, when you look here, you know, I mean, if most of the references are the heap references. So, so copying all or on the fly, they are all pretty much the same because that's only sp small part of the cost. Uh, but it did matter in some programs, as you can see, this speed up is higher than that. Uh, here these two do well, this one is higher, this one is higher. So it does give you know, some speed up in some program, like this is 2.5 and this is like 3. So it does, it's not insignificant, but uh, in some cases on the fly is good enough. Actually, so this is kind of uh, summarizing why uh, you got good speed ups in these programs. This is showing that when we are doing these copying or doing the misspeculation checks and so forth, I mean, the instructions we executed there were only small part of the computation because we were doing a lot of work and then doing a little bit of checking. So it worked for these programs, but it may not work for uh, other applications where the parallelism is more fine-grained. Uh, because here it was like 7% of the instructions you're spending on doing all this checking and stuff. So therefore, it, you, you could afford to use this technique. But of course, this is not going to be true for every application. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in, a, in a slide or two. So, uh, this is simply showing that, of course, your memory overhead goes up. Okay, so in the programs, you know, two to three times, and here almost six times. So the more threads you have, the more memory you consume because each of these threads have their own memory. So that's the cost you are paying because you are, you know, ma making use of much more memory. Um, yeah. So so the thing is that so the key thing is that in those programs we were doing coarse uh, grain parallelization, so it was fine. But that's not always the case. Uh, so now we started looking at, you know, can we provide architectural support? And this is what we are doing these days, so that we can do these things at more finer grain level. We can use the same model, but do more fine grained sort of parallel execution. And the size that you using? approximately how many instructions? Uh, actually, I don't know, but it was. Uh, I mean, it was these instructions that we executed for checking. They were, let's say, hundreds of instructions, as opposed to those were at least, you know, tens of thousands or more. You know, so it's a very small fraction of uh, the, the the work. In, in the case of parser, if memory serves me, there, there, for a reference input, there are tens of billions or hundreds of billions of instructions, but in in actuality, not too many loop iterations on the order of hundreds. Uh, so. 
for parser, each loop iteration might be 10 million instructions. Oh, okay, so, so they're very long so they're inputs. So they're very, very long. Yeah, yeah. very long um, inputs, yeah. I'm not sure what yeah. loops you did in, in No, I mean, MCF we did the reference yeah. input, yeah. No, yeah. But oh, MCF I mean, for parser. Okay. is a very similar situation yeah, where yeah. it does a lot of work. Yeah, so there's iteration. a lot of work in these, uh, and that's why it works. So, so in the fine grain one, so this is an example. This is the example application we are looking at, that if you have barriers and you execute parse, then you're going to, going to do a little bit of work. So now if you do checking and it costs you a lot, then it's not worth it. So we try to apply the same idea for the loop is running in parallel. You reach a barrier, you don't stop, you continue. But when you continue, you write in a separate memory and then you have to copy back, same model. Here, what happened is when we tried to do this, uh, our program slowed down, you know. Of course, we did some useful work, but then we did too much checking and too much of this. So it kind of motivates uh, for, uh, to have a better um, you know, hardware support so you can bring down the cost. So, uh, you know, so the question is what kind of solution should we have for this uh, then? I mean, what should we put in hardware? So the key thing for us is that um, two things. One is copying, you know, so we haven't looked at how to reduce that cost. But the other cost is then we do these checks that, you know, has misspeculation happened or not. And so we, so we have proposed some support for that. And the support we have, see, the, see what we want to do is we want to propose support which is not specifically for one thing, but hopefully something which can, you know, you can say is generally useful for many different things if you were to provide it on multi -course. So we didn't uh, provide any dedicated support for this, but what we are doing is we, we are using this idea that, see, if you could expose these cache events uh, like invalidates and value replies, to the application, then you can identify the interprocessor dependencies when they occur. And misspeculation, simply that's all you want to know. Was there a dependence or not? So, you know, so if you have a mechanism, so you can expose this, these events to the application, then the application can say, oh, if this event happened, misspeculation has occurred and I will just redo the work. So, now it can be used for other things also. It can be used for other things, for example, um, uh, there are a lot of monitoring applications. So, so actually, let me describe the support, then I will explain why that, that could be used for other things. Yeah. So I think probably like transaction, people who are trying to do transaction memory are, uh, want this kind of support in the hardware too. But the problem mm -hmm. here is that you have to uh, keep a lot of state in the hardware and you start running out of the, that state of the or the hardware that you put in runs out of phase, you know. So okay, yeah. no, okay. So so let me respond to that. So you know, like obviously, I don't want to go that route. I was so uh, emphatic about pointing out that I don't do recovery by rollbacks. Okay. So I, I I don't want to go there. So in our case, I don't want all the state. I just want to know there was an interprocessor dependence. Okay. So that's all I want the hardware to do. Just give me the events. Now, if I want to analyze for them forever and figure out which location caused the de dependence and how can I now save it and recover it, like which the transactional memory people have to do because you speculatively do things, then you have to roll back. That's a different thing. But I'm not, you know, so for, for this work, I would say that's overkill. I mean, I'm, I won't use most of the state. So in that sense, I agree with you. I don't want all the state. <laughs> I, I want a simple mechanism which will help me do the job. So for example, like if you're doing race detection, I want to know races occurred, and then you go, you know, maybe capture the instructions which caused the races, and then you replay, and then you figure out what location it was and all that. But you don't need to really do all that. But for the purpose of dependent detection, don't you run into the same problems where if something is evicted from the cache before there's the actual interthread dependent, you now have to conservatively assume that there will be some dependence in the Actually, future. Actually, yeah, so in this, one, uh, in this one, it is conservative to some extent. Because, for example, even if you find a dependence between, I mean, it could be at the block level, like you're finding at a block level, but actually, it's, yeah. I, I, what, what I suppose I meant was that uh, the, the question earlier was talking about how do you virtualize all of these things mm -hmm. so that your, your transaction sizes or whatnot can mm -hmm. be arbitrary. And you were saying that you're not actually storing extra state in the hardware, which is true. But the flip side of that is that the ability to track dependencies relies on, you know, it, it can basically only dependencies can be tracked between what fits in the cache. 
because beyond that level, you now no longer remember that you locally even accessed something. So from that standpoint, if one task is overflowing the cache regularly, you have no confidence about uh, what depends on Okay, so actually, the, uh, we don't have that issue because really the way we are maintaining these, uh, the information is if you have a dependence, it's like the shadow memory concept. So we are using shadow memory, and if you if you wish something, I mean, you're saving state, but you're not saving, I mean, you're saving it in memory. Okay, not memory. Okay, so, yeah, okay. so basically that part is still in software. Okay. You know? So, uh, yeah, so we have spent a lot of time thinking about this. <laughs> okay. So uh, in this, I didn't mention, but this relies on our work on shadow memory where we have, you know, how we implement it and so forth. But okay. I'm not really talking about that. I'm just focusing on the other part. Okay. Yeah, so, so we won't rely on the hardware for that. Do you look at objects smaller than a cache line? I mean, there are many, most of the objects are smaller right? than the cache line size. Yeah, so, so the thing is basically, uh, so once you have these events, you know, the question is uh, what you do with them after that. I mean, whether you... Or is it just false sharing? Yeah, exactly. But I think I, that can be done, but then you'll have to really do more work. So the way we look at it is that we expose these events, then the application should decide what is good enough even if it's imprecise or a heuristic. And that you program, you know, whatever application you're doing, you program the handlers. And in that process, you can do these trade-offs. Uh, you know, so that's, so the, the basic support is very simple. So this is just to show how the barrier thing works. So this is for an example for the, you know, the Jacobi, where uh, you go through, you know, a bunch of points where each point you replace with the average of the neighboring points. And then you do that all over again. So if you parallelize this, you divide the work among different cores. You basically divide the points into strips, and you give it to different cores, and each core will compute its strip. Then what will happen is once all of them have done it once, they will do it again. And then they will read the values which are computed by other strips before. Therefore, you put a barrier you know, in between. So all of them do the work, then they've synchronized, then they do the work. Now what happens is if you're waiting at the barriers, we can go ahead and execute past the barriers. That's the speculation. And when you do that, so here is, let's say you computed strip B, and now you recompute strip B. When you recompute strip B, you'll be using these rows to compute these values. And those may not have been computed yet. So you would be speculatively reading the old values. And so that's where it's the same model you know, as before. We want to know if the, when we read these, were they, were they already computed or not? And, uh, you know, so, and, and what we do is basically when you speculatively compute this to B, you don't write it into the place you were going to write into, you write it in a scratch place, and then you will copy it back. <coughs> so, if we just do this in software, as I said, we slow down the program. Uh, but if we have the hardware support, we, we don't slow down, we get modest you know, improvements in speed up. So basically, instead of 10% slowdown, we get 10% speed up uh, for some of these programs. So, but now let me talk a little bit about the software support. So, okay, so what we want to do is we want to expose the cache events. I think I already mentioned this, but let me explain what the support is. Basically, the cache events are fixed, you know, the ones that can be exposed. And you as a user, if you want, you can provide handlers for those events. And uh, in addition to that, um, uh, when you, once you provide the handlers, you have these instructions now. This specifies the handler, uh, you know, where the handler is for a particular event. But then you also have these instructions which says where these handlers should be active. So these handlers need not be all the time active. Like you, once you go past the barrier up till a certain point, you say start handler and handler. That means the handler is only active within this code. And the second thing is we have an instruction which says which events you want to keep. Because you don't want to keep every event, you know, every, for example, invalidate message you get. You only want to keep the invalid messages that matter to you. So you can say only if the block address is between this and this, then remember it. So, so, you're, so because you're only interested in finding the dependencies, if they occur in the speculatively executed code, that's why these first, these instructions and only if they are from the relevant part of the memory, that's why that instruction, okay? And then you go ahead and, um, you know, you, you 
program the handler like in this example we could just program the handler to say you know you can do a set jump and long jump and go back to the beginning of the the code that you executed speculatively and that's that's good enough and uh, but then you are specifying which addresses matter to you in the filter instruction and once you leave this code then the handler is no longer active it's not being considered none of these events are being tracked so it's not for uh, all the time it's when you need it to and these were few of the programs where the barrier uh, if we did it in software we got you know slowdowns but if we had this support we got speed ups now the these programs are spending a lot more time in the barrier only part of it we are getting as as a return in speed up because the other part is due to copying so we're not you know like if there was this much time half the time if this much time was we spend in the barrier half of the time i'm using to do copying from the other half i am doing some misspeculation so maybe 30 35% i actually get back as useful work uh, so copying is still an issue where we do, you know we don't have any support we have hardware for this or is this a software simulation? This is simulation on you know, simulator, you know, with, you know, so because we had to implement the, the instructions and so forth. So the same could be, you know, so there's a lot of recent work on uh, record replay, re record and replay based debugging, and you have many systems like Bugnet, Strata, FTR to basically, uh, you know, do that. So we can simulate these schemes once you have these, using these handlers, you can essentially capture the information that you were capturing there. Of course, I have to again go back to what I mentioned before that um, you have to keep some additional information which we keep in shadow memory and that information, you know, that part I haven't talked about but, but you need the shadow memory also because and there is another issue once you keep this metadata, so let's say you have some, uh, some real data and you have some meta information, you keep it somewhere else. And the issue is that whenever the data changes, you change the metadata, but then they should be atomically updated. Or at least you should see them as atomic. So the way these handlers are designed, you know, because you can invoke them where you want to, uh, you can also select where you want to invoke them. If you can invoke them at fixed points, then you know the atomicity would be guaranteed. Because if you update memory and you update meta metadata and then you invoke the handler, then the atomicity would be given to you. But if the, if the event would come up at any time and invo invoke the handler, then the atomicity wouldn't be there. So we have two versions of this uh, handlers. Either you can invoke them any time an event happens or you say where you want to invoke it. So for example, you could have said at the end of the start handler, end handler, at the end handler, now invoke the handler and then process all the events which you have collected. Uh, anyway, so that's kind of the summary of what I've talked about and the recent work we are doing is, you know, first just looking at more aggressive techniques to do speculation. Uh, then we are looking to see if we can leverage some of this work to do uh, more fine grained optimization. So for example, uh, here when I say speculative alloc risk allocation, what I mean is that if there are many threads and you think other threads will touch the mem some part of the memory, you can't put it in registers. What we want to do is we want to put them in registers and we want to execute this thread speculatively, but the end, at the end realize that, oh, okay, this was speculatively done. So basically leverage what we already have to maybe aggressively do register allocation, which you, you know, couldn't do if, you know, if you were running the threads in parallel. Uh, and we are, of course, exploring these monitoring applications, variety of applications, and to see if the support we are providing, whether they can conveniently with this support, we can program those applications. So the work is on both tracks. Some is on, you know, pushing it further to optimize the programs more. Some for the other applications to see if this uh, cache uh, support, architecture support can be more widely used for many applications. We think we can because we designed it that way, but actually going through the applications, doing them, seeing what you benefit. That's what we are in the process of doing. Okay, so that's all I have here. Question about any effect multiprogramming has on these results. So, have you done any of those experiments? No, no. So here, uh, the, when we are using that machine, we are running basically, you know, our program. Uh, I mean, we can do those experiments at least. 
because you know we can spawn off other things and then in, at the same time run it. But uh, but I think then uh, that means you would have to figure out how many cores you can use and when to use them and so on. So we haven't looked at those issues yet. When when there are other applications running, how to kind of scale back or you know how many cores we give to an application or how many threads we, we haven't done any of that. So right now basically it is like we run it. We assume eight threads you can run because we have eight cores and nobody's using our machine. <laughs> yeah. To what extent did you have to rewrite the loops and to what extent could that automatically be done with your tools? So basically, uh, we didn't rewrite anything at source level. We rewrote after, at LLVM intermediate core level, we rewrote after LLVM told us this part. You know, because see, one of the things is that some information we have from profiling, but there are parts of the code which are never executed. So that information we get from LLVM. Once we have identified which parts they are, then we are, you know, rewriting them. And you found for all these applications that the number of such interactions were fairly small, the number of dependencies? Well, I mean, yeah, most of these applications, because it's the outer loop, the rewriting is not that hard. Um, of course, uh, I mean, we hope we can automate. Uh, that's why we rewrote at the intermediate level, because we want to automate it, you know, not, you know, so it's not fully done yet, but we would like to do that. Uh, but uh, uh, but I was talking to uh, you know uh, you earlier. Uh, what we would also like to do is the information we collect, you could give it back to the user, and the user could rewrite it. Because if you want to rewrite it, actually it's better to go back to the source level. I mean, at least for these applications, probably it's better to go back to the source level than to the lower level. We were simply doing it at lower level because we wanted to make sure that what we are doing, we think we can do it. <laughs> you know, is using the automation. So some of these benchmarks are, are, are like Rajiv said, they're, they're very easy at that yeah. outermost loop level. And so, you know, having just gone through the process of doing similar parallelizations for my yeah. thesis, I can say like in Parser, for example, one of the biggest obstacles is they use a high watermark memory allocator. Mm -hmm. um, and so for every, they're processing a bunch of sentences in a file, and they just remember how many blocks they've allocated the last time, and if you need more, you allocate a few more. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then at the end, they end up popping off of a stack. So if you do dependence analysis, you see all these stack manipulations. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out the stack is always empty at the beginning of every loop yeah. iteration. Right. Um, so you can either analyze your way to that yeah. realization or speculate your way to that realization. Uh, either way, yeah. that's the, the solution to the problem. Um, and so some of the, the you know, uh, as part of my dissertation work, some of these things we were able to automate. And some of the things, it's just like, yeah. all right, this is too true. Yeah, like, actually, yeah. some of the programs are from, you right. use it. So right. we benefited from his work, because then we said, these are the programs that he has put through. So let's see whether this approach can right. work, work there. And I think, uh, and some of those, like, you know, you should maybe go back to the user level and do yeah. that. Yeah, because like uh, the things that, writing their own memory uh, in fact, actually, I, I put it <laughs> under the sort of, uh, heading of harmless dependencies that you can ignore them. But these harmless ones are the ones that you would know them. You know, but automating that part is, is, is painful. painful. <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting to see because doing in software you've got these loops which are on the order of I guess 10,000 instructions mm -hmm. or more. And when I did the same sort of stuff, I did it with hardware, um, you know, with the Kumeo uh, um, Onikoden's uh, um, chip, right, the, the Hydra chip. And our loops run order of 300 instructions, 300 final instructions in a completely different world. I noticed that there's almost no overlap between the, the applications we could do and the applications. Yeah, yeah. Doing. So on the other hand, I mean, the reason is because we knew we were doing everything in software, so we looked for the coarse grain one. Yeah, exactly. And but yeah. that's why we are doing the follow-up work. Yeah, we could not buffer that sort of state, and um, of course we could pick off these really small loops because mm -hmm. you know our, our communication delays were so short. Mm -hmm. it, it, I think it actually turns out to be very important to pick what the loop nest level because uh, depending on whether you go really deep or really far out, you can just find you know these tons and tons of dependencies that prevent parallelization. Mm -hmm. But there's generally a sweet spot level where if you hit that level, there tends not to be a whole lot of loop carry mm -hmm. dependencies and you know, the parts that exist can be split into this prologue and epilogue mm -hmm. and whatnot. But it, it does require sort of carefully picking that nest level. Mm -hmm. Going back to the hardware. Um, so the only thing that you're interested in is cache invalidates and basically calling a handler 
you have no state inside the L1 or L2 that you have invalidates coming in from a different chip? Uh, well, actually, have. okay. So, in the case where I said we buffer the events, then you have to have some place to buffer the events. So, uh, if you want to buffer, so in this work, since we are only using it for small chunks of code, we are assuming you have a dedicated place where you can buffer certain number of events. As opposed to, uh, but if you want to scale it, then you will have to go to the cache or something where you can, you know, every block maybe can carry some state. But we are not doing that right now. Yeah. Because uh, we are not using it sort of, we are using it for certain applications and in those applications we know the code is only this much. And, you know, it's not so many events would occur and, you know, and, and we are only interested in very narrow set of events anyway, you know. And, and, and if, even if that buffer would overflow, then you can just say misspeculation and throw away everything. Right. So have you thought about what potential things you could do if you had information on the cache line that it's been, that it's been read, that it's been basically read between your start handler and end handler? So basically it's been read speculatively or not, mm -hmm. and, or it's been written speculatively yeah, or so, not? Yeah, so right now it's actually, for us, it is most convenient because we have to then go through this inf the events. It's better to have them together as opposed to look in the cache because then you'll have to say which blocks I care about then look at all of them. So I think it just depends how much you want to scale, I mean, what you're using it for. If you start scaling it to large number of events, okay. you know, it, it may. But right now, the uh, monitoring applications are the same way. We have, you know, we, we instrumented something only for this much code. We care about this issue not outside it, and so we don't need a lot of events. It's only to, you know, like for example, in, in some of these, when you're doing these metadata updates, in the data updates, you want to make sure nothing happens in between. So if somebody, and so for that, again, you know the number of instructions, it's just these few. And so it's not, so it's not general arbitrary code, like a loop or something in there. MIPS, PowerPC, and Alpha kind of have a very crude version of this where you can do load with reservation in the store conditional. It's not intended for parallelism, but it's intended for atomic increments and that sort of thing, grabbing logs, mm -hmm. whatever. So is, are you basically proposing a, an enhancement of that mechanism? They seem to converge at some level. Well, I mean, I, I was thinking more like this that uh, maybe. Uh, so w what I'm trying to do here is basically I want I wanted to do course level things like this much computation and at the end simply know if an event happened. So I'm not so much interested in all the like for example if misspeculation happened all the ways in which it happened, but simply yes and no answer whether it happened. So in that sense, it's so the store the conditional store would fail if anyone came in modified the location before you did. No, but uh, but the thing is I want to monitor a lot of memory. I mean, a lot, me lot of memory means not just one location, many locations. So, so you might want to do that at a page level or even multi-page. multi, multi -page. So maybe page is too big and what you're saying is too small. It seems to be somewhere well, in between. What I'm saying is what's implemented on hardware today. Yeah. 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 So I, I thought load and store conditional only allowed you to monitor a very small number of locations before it would overflow. It's one. I think it's just, just one, one reservation granule. Yeah. Okay, so that's very small. So what you're saying is that you would want that extortion extended to hundreds or thousands of locations? Well, that, that would probably be impractical, impractical, but perhaps. So I think load store conditional tends to be at the cache line level. Maybe at the TLB level would be more similar to what we need for this thesis. So page level could work in some cases if you made sure in that page you only put the stuff you want to put and not something else. So then you would take your stuff and spread it across pages, you know. Uh, I mean, that's another way to use something which is already there. You know. How you uh, dealt with the shadow memory and the, the efficiency of, of doing address translation and other things? Too. Oh, yeah, yeah. So what we are doing with shadow memory is that, um, 
So there is some hardware support there too for shadow memory. Okay, so even the, the initial results were from simulation or? Okay, so in this one, we didn't need the elaborate shadow memory. Okay. But what I'm saying is that it, uh, uh, for some of the applications, like when I said replay and all that, oh. there we needed it because, you know, for, for there we need a lot of shadow memory. Right. So what we are doing there is uh, something like this, that uh, every time you allocate a page, you actually allocate a shadow page. And when you uh, write your code, uh, your instrumentation code, you are addressing, actually you address, you don't explicitly address the shadow page, you just address the original location. But, but you communicate that these, this is like, a, this is instrumentation code, so you assume that the hardware will translate it into the other page. <coughs> so that way you're not like creating multiple TLB entries, you just have one TLB entry and the shadow page is, you know, simply just next to it. The two pages are allocated together so you can compute the address in the translation process. And so that's the address translation part. And the other part is this atomicity. And that is uh, related to this invoking the handler. If you invoke it, if you can choose when to invoke right. it, then you can avoid this problem. So, so what about for just the, the speculative parallelizations that you did in this work uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, at the beginning of the talk? That is all software. Yeah. That's all, so you just did like hash table lookups or the, the, the normal? Uh, yeah, that is purely, so basically the, you didn't need uh, much shadow memory there. Actually, it, I was saying mapping and all that, you know. So it's there, but that's not shared. I mean, it's per thread, so you didn't need. Well, I'm just imagining, so for you, you, I, you did parallelize MCF, which has a lot of linked data structures. Yeah, sure. Which means there's pointers stored in data structures which are live into the, the code you're parallelizing. Yeah. So when I get a pointer, how do I guarantee that I'm going to access my lo thread local copy of that pointer rather oh, than... Oh, okay. So you, what you do is basically with, with those, you go there and then you allocate the entire object. So basically you copy the entire object that you allocated and then you reference only that. So you never reference the global heap. Okay. So you, you only copy the, just like you copy the stack, you start copying the heap now. And, and but I, I guess I just, I don't understand how the pointers work. Like how do you remember which pointers are original program, uh, original heap pointers? Like if I copy a data structure with a pointer in it, then the copy is pointing to the oh, original Oh, I see, I see. Uh, and then, you know, now as I'm executing, I need to say, oh, that was an original heap pointer, yeah, so I yeah, need to yeah. translate it. Yeah, how did we do that? I'll have, I'll have to ask my students how okay. did we do that. <laughs> uh, I just know because <laughs> because we are copying the entire objects, and of course it doesn't make any sense if you copy the objects and now they're still pointing. Right. They, they should be pointing. Yeah, I just, this is a, a very yeah. big problem in a lot of transactional memory implementations, and typically people use hash tables around every load or around every yeah, store yeah. and yeah, so I think, uh, slows things yeah. down tremendously. Yeah, yeah. So I think they did track what mallux and this kind of stuff, you know, to see what was allocated and then okay. they make a copy. And But I have to make sure how they did the pointers. Yeah, I'd be very curious yeah, to know yeah. because that's one of the, one of the bigger problems. Yeah, of, uh, yeah cop whenever you make copies, yeah, the exactly. pointers all get messed up. Yeah. yeah, this is also why the slowdown is not big enough. Yeah. No, that, that's, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's it's almost no slowdown. There yeah. should be much bigger yeah. slowdown. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe the teachers. For example, I know in my work we cheated and assumed hardware support. <laughs> 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 How did that yeah. work for you? <laughs> <laughs> you can assume a lot of things. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I'll let you know. Yeah. Okay. Let's thank the speaker. Thank you.